We'll talk here about renal artery stenosis. And uh, if you looked at my nephrology lectures, uh, I did talk about renal artery stenosis in the hypertension section because uh, hypertension can be caused by renal artery stenosis. It's, it's an important cause of hypertension, not because it's necessarily really common, but because renal artery stenosis is a common cause of refractory hypertension. So we'll just do a quick overview of what it is. Uh, I'll introduce some pertinent anatomy and pathophysiology, uh, just to recap some of that, and uh, then we'll go over a clinical presentation, how it might appear on the USMLE or in real life, uh, and then uh, how we go about diagnosing it, and then I'll talk about the differential diagnosis, one of which are really important, and then the treatment and the surgical procedures that are undertaken to treat RAS. So renal artery stenosis is a disease of the renal artery or both renal arteries, which results in decreased perfusion to the kidneys. And that's a problem, yes, because it results in less blood going to the kidneys, uh, both because you're getting less perfusion to the kidneys and because you're getting uh, less filtration. But it's also a problem because the kidneys are responsible for sensing uh, what our blood pressure is. And if you get decreased perfusion to the kidneys, the kidneys are going to be uh, sort of uh, under an illusion that you have less blood pressure than what you actually have. So this is going to result in activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which remember is sensed, the blood pressure is sensed at the juxtaglomerular apparatus, uh, and that results in the release of renin if it perceives that you have a low blood pressure. And that's actually what happens when you have renal artery stenosis. So you get this elevated uh, renin and high amounts of renin result in higher amounts of aldosterone, which results in hypertension. So hypertension is really the big complication from renal artery stenosis and it's often how it presents. Uh, renal artery stenosis is by definition a cause of secondary hypertension, so it's not the primary idiopathic hypertension, which is what about 90 to 95% of patients who have hypertension have. It's secondary hypertension. It's hypertension that's due to a medical cause that we know, and this is about 1 to 10% of all hypertension patients. I should add 1 to 10% of all hypertension patients have secondary hypertension. Uh, which can be due to multiple different causes, not just renal artery stenosis. So the causes of renal artery stenosis are primarily atherosclerosis, that we would suspect in an older patient, uh, patients who have a history of, uh, of things that suggest atherosclerosis, such as MI, angina, uh, past stroke, claudication, etc. Younger patients can get renal artery stenosis, and indeed patients who are younger, who have uh, hypertension, renal artery stenosis is a big one that we think of. Uh, patients who are younger who get renal artery stenosis usually have the disease process known as fibromuscular dysplasia, which we don't have a really big understanding about uh, why that happens, but uh, we do know that fibromuscular dysplasia is the cause of renal artery stenosis in younger patients more often than not. Decreased renal function can also exist in patients with renal artery stenosis, as I alluded to earlier, but the most problematic complication of renal artery stenosis is not necessarily the decreased renal function, but it's the hypertension, because this is often refractory, and the hypertension can lead to uh, a worsening of the renal function itself. So you can get decreased renal function not just because, because you have decreased perfusion, but because you have refractory hypertension that's not treated properly. So this is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. I don't want to talk about this in too great of depth, but what I do want to uh, just point out is that renin uh, is, uh, is you're going to have more renin because you have decreased renal perfusion. Your kidney senses that, the G JGA senses that as, uh, as decreased blood pressure. Uh, and in most cases, when you're dehydrated, that's what it is. It's a decreased blood pressure. Your kidney senses it. Uh, so this is the decreased blood pressure and secretes renin so that you uh, retain sodium and therefore retain water. That's, you're supposed to do that. But when you have decreased perfusion to the kidneys, it's sensing 
low blood pressure when you really don't have low blood pressure and it's going to continue to sense low blood pressure even as your blood pressure goes up. So that uh, increase in renin is what's really behind the elevated blood pressure. Uh, here's some relevant anatomy. So uh, remember the abdominal aorta gives off many, many, many vessels. Uh, a lot of which are important when we're talking about peripheral artery disease uh, and atherosclerosis. Uh, so there's your celiac trunk uh, and your superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, which are all important uh, uh, when we think of uh, ischemia to the bowel. Uh, and then you have uh, your left and right renal arteries here. And the uh, abdominal aorta is usually described as uh, as supraceliac, meaning above the celiac artery, or celiac trunk, and uh, infraceliac, meaning below. So you may hear those words thrown around. All right, so when do we suspect renal artery stenosis as a particular cause of secondary hypertension? Remember that secondary hypertension has several different causes. Uh, it could be uh, Cushing's or, uh, or uh, contraceptive pills. Uh, it could be hyperaldosteronism, which we know as Kahn syndrome. It could be coarctation of the aorta. It could be pheochromocytoma. It could be uh, renal artery stenosis. So there are lots of different causes of secondary hypertension. When you have a patient with renal artery stenosis, some of the things that may stand out are as follows. So a patient with severe hypertension who's under 35 or older than 55. Primary hypertension tends to develop in patients who are 35 to 55 years of age. That's usually the two decades when it happens. Uh, so if you have a patient with hypertension who's significantly young, meaning less than 30, 35 years of age, or uh, significantly older where you don't develop primary hypertension, you should suspect secondary hypertension. And anytime you suspect secondary hypertension, renal artery stenosis should be suspected. If there's a sudden worsening of hypertension, particularly in a patient with controlled hypertension, that's another reason to think possibly renal artery stenosis. If you have refractory hypertension that doesn't respond to polytherapy, uh, that's another reason. So remember that when patients have primary hypertension or what we suspect to be primary hypertension, we usually start them out on an ACE inhibitor, uh, then go to a beta blocker, then possibly go to a diuretic. Uh, so if they're on multiple drugs and it's not controlling the hypertension, you should think of renal artery stenosis, especially, of course, if all uh, any of these patients, if they have risk factors for atherosclerosis. And then, of course, the telltale sign of, a, of an abdominal or flank brewy, uh, if, it's, uh, if that's heard, you should definitely think of renal artery stenosis, this one most of all. So the history in patients with RAS, atherosclerosis, as mentioned, is the number one cause. So if the patient has a history of uh, CVA or uh, unstable angina or uh, even angina itself, uh, if they have a history of uh, MI, uh, if they have a uh, history of any kind of peripheral vascular disease, uh, claudication, um, if you, uh, if, even, if they, even if they have a, a carotid artery uh, brewery, you should, uh, you should think of possibly renal artery stenosis, just because all of these are, are just fall under that big umbrella of atherosclerosis. So uh, stroke, MI, peripheral vascular disease are uh, symptoms uh, of, uh, of, 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 of peripheral vascular disease. Uh, so everything that falls under that umbrella. Uh, and then if they have a history of dyslipidemia, even if they don't have a history of, of these disorders, uh, then I would suspect RAS just because uh, you're, you're thinking atherosclerosis. Okay, uh, symptom-wise, of course, they're going to have hypertension. Uh, because they are retaining fluid and retaining sodium, you can get pulmonary edema from that uh, or even peripheral edema. So crackles, rails, fluid retention. And then, of course, the abdominal brewery is highly specific. So you can either hear this in the abdomen or you can hear this in the flank. And this brewery you hear actually during systole and diastole. So it's kind of this back and forth sounding brewery. Uh, 
the workup in any patient that has hypertension, uh, possibly due to renal artery stenosis, you should at least get routine labs to assess for renal dysfunction. You should get a urinalysis to assess for glomerular nephritis, uh, and then a lipid profile. Now, when you do suspect renal artery stenosis, the best initial test to get is a duplex ultrasound. You can also get a Doppler ultrasound, but from what I've read, the duplex ultrasound is, uh, the, is the best initial test. And what you're doing here is comparing flow velocities. Uh, the most accurate test and the test that you're going to get before surgery is going to be an angiography. And it's important to know that uh, you don't need to know what type of angiography to get. Uh, whether you're doing traditional uh, CTA or MRA, but what you do need to know is that CTA uses contrast, uh, the CT angiography uses contrast, whereas the uh, MR angiography doesn't. Uh, so if the patient has uh, a poor renal function, uh, you might want to uh, stay away from uh, the CT angiography. All right. The differential diagnosis for RAS include a few different things. So hypertensive emergency should be number one on your differential. Uh, and it's not really a differential so much as it's uh, something that may coexist with renal artery stenosis. So if the patient uh, has a severely elevated blood pressure, uh, particularly a systolic blood pressure of over 220, uh, you need to be treating the hypertensive emergency first. So you're going to be uh, you're, you're going to diagnose the patient with hypertensive emergency before you work them up for renal artery stenosis. So don't get tri tripped up by that, especially on the USMLE, when they give you a patient and make it sound like renal artery stenosis, then they ask you what your next step is. If the patient has a, hy has a hypertensive emergency, you have to treat that first. Um, so uh, hypertensive emergencies are, like it says, an emergency and uh, diagnosis and treatment takes precedence over RAS. You're going to treat the, the, these patients with IV nitroprusside. That's the treatment of choice that will usually come up on the USMLE. However, you can also use calcium channel blockers. It's important not to lower the blood pressure too fast. So you don't want to lower your mean arterial blood pressure more than 25% uh, within the first 20, 24 to 48 hours. Okay, then another thing to think of are the other causes of secondary hypertension. So you should consider that if you don't hear an abdominal or flank brewery, if the patient is between 35 and 55, uh, or if uh, features suggesting another process exists. So if they have signs pointing towards Cushing's uh, syndrome, so if they have uh, those... Uh, if, if they have the, uh, the moon facies, if they have the buffalo hump, if they have the abdominal striae. Um, and then uh, pheochromocytoma, would, you would think of if they've, got the, uh, if they've got a really high heart rate or other symptoms suggesting uh, sympathetic activation. Uh, and then you'd also think of other causes of secondary hypertension besides RAS if the duplex study is equivocal. And then primary hypertension is sort of your diagnosis of exclusion if renal artery stenosis and other causes of secondary hypertension are unlikely. So the big thing I want to get across here, though, is if the patient has a very high blood pressure, meaning more than 220 systolic or uh, 120 diastolic, uh, they should be treated first for their hypertensive emergency and generally that's going to be IV nitroprusides and also fluids. You also want to make sure you have a crash cart ready because these patients, because their, their uh, blood pressure gets so high, they're at risk for, uh, for arrhythmia and uh, for other possible complications. So uh, definitely make sure that you know um, you got to treat that first. This is just covering your ABCs. So assuming that the patient is not in a hypertensive emergency, uh, then you can decide whether you want to treat the patient medically or surgically. Usually patients who present with RAS are already being treated medically. Uh, so uh, patients who are already being treated medically, you're not going to undertake medical therapy because you're already trying to treat them medically. Uh, but you can also, if they don't have, uh, if they're not being treated medically, there are some patients who do qualify for medical treatment. 
those would be the patient, first off, the patients who have uh, less than severe disease who really you don't want to do surgery in. So let's say they're, they're significantly older or they have other, other complications. Uh, but you can also do uh, medical management in patients who have unilateral disease with less than 80% blockage and only if they have mild hypertension. So medical therapy, uh, whether or not we can do it, it's actually it's pretty limited, a limited set of patients. So in most patients with renal artery stenosis, we're going to need to do a surgical intervention. And so the two surgical interventions that are undertaken uh, are percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, PTA, uh, or aorta renal bypass. PTA is the procedure of choice. This is what we prefer to do if we can. Um, and usually this is the, the uh, first therapy, and if it doesn't work, then we go over to the bypass. So we pr prefer to do PTA, um, especially for patients with unilateral disease and in patients who have disease in the mid uh, to proximal portion of the renal artery. If the stent placement doesn't work, and that's what this is, it's a stent placement, if the stent placement is not effective, then we will go forth with aortorenal bypass. So this is usually reserved as a second line for patients in whom PTA is not effective. But if you're asked, um, which of the following surgical interventions is, uh, is, is your treatment of choice, then you're going to go with PTA. This is the surgical intervention that you want to do. The only time you're going to go to aorta renal bypass is in patients uh, in whom PTA is not effective or in patients who already have a stent who have blockage in their stent. All right. So this is uh, a renal artery PTA. So you approach it uh, through the abdominal aorta uh, with a balloon tipped catheter. You go through the uh, blockage and then you place your stent through the blockage. And then this, these are a few different kinds of aorta renal bypass. So you can do uh, an aorta renal bypass by cutting the renal artery distal to the blockage uh, and then putting the graft, uh, connecting the graft from the uh, abdominal aorta to the, uh, the distal cut of the renal artery. Uh, or you can uh, put in a, uh, a stent here, uh, or not a stent, a, uh, a graft here uh, from the abdominal aorta uh, without cutting the uh, the renal artery uh, and just putting it in this way. Um, and you can do it either to one artery or to two arteries. Uh, I wouldn't pay attention to these. These are slightly more complicated. Uh, but these are some of the various ways you can do a aorta renal bypass. So most importantly that I want you to get out of this lecture is uh, remember to uh, approach your ABCs first. So if they have very high blood pressure, more than 220 over 120, you need to treat them for their hypertensive emergency with IV nitroprusside. Uh, but otherwise, uh, patients who have renal artery stenosis, we're going to treat them with PTA in most cases. And generally, PTA is enough and patients uh, recover quite well from, from this therapy. And that's all I've got.